Women represent less than 5% of America's prison population, but the effects of their incarceration are way out of proportion to their actual numbers. The overwhelming majority of women in prison are single mothers of children under 13. When they go to prison, the family is dissolved and the children flounder. Most of the women are poor. Most of them have committed economic crimes, like theft, shoplifting, passing bad checks, and welfare fraud. About one woman in five is in for murder. A surprising number of them are battered wives. Women are the fastest growing segment of the prison population. Their numbers have nearly tripled in the past 10 years. As women's role in society has expanded, there's been a dramatic change in the criminal justice system's attitude towards female offenders. Okay, I'll try to need your weapon. Yes, sir. While judges were once inclined to be lenient, equal opportunity has brought women the equal opportunity to go to prison. This place looks like a castle from the outside. <laughs> it looks like a medieval thing. A new inmate has to change into a jumpsuit. Once she's on the ground, she can wear her own clothes. I got 13 months to do in here. It's not that long, I guess. All her belongings are taken to be inspected and cataloged. But the most important thing she loses is her children. Do you have any kids? Um, two, and I'm about five months pregnant now. How do you feel about having a child in prison? Um, the foster home that my other kids are in, this one's going to go to, too. They'll be too young to know. All my kids are under three, so they ain't gonna be old enough to remember. Hope. Why are you here? Why am I here? Um, three counts of burglary. Your pictures, do they let you keep them? Because I brought pictures of my kids. Yeah, I got one. Yeah, I got one. I saw you too. Thank you. Oh my goodness. Uh, you don't look old enough to have a son 19 years old. <laughs> uh, oh my three. goodness. Is he the oldest? Mm -hmm. He came see me in Wheaton Jail just before a uh, Tuesday last week. Oh, my husband brought my kid, my little boy, up to see me yesterday. What, it was visiting day yesterday? No, mm. it was just special visits for right before oh. they transport you. They let you have a contact visit with your kids where you can hold them and and stuff because the rest of the time you're there you have to visit them in a booth mm. there's a wall and three inches of glass yeah. that separate you that's what weed is it's like that yeah okay take a seat there okay you can smile if you like <laughs> oh no by the one huh inmate i hate that word okay now i like mother My daughter saw this, she would think it was a game. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just sitting up here thinking, wow, wow. Okay, I'm going to be going into room two. A new inmate goes first to quarantine, a special unit where the women are given psychological, medical, and educational evaluations. She will stay here two to three weeks until she's assigned to a security level, a cottage, and a job or school. The bars, rats, um, men guard that rape the women. That's what I thought it would be like. It's not like that, but there's a lot of mental oppression, and you have to deal with various attitudes and personalities, and you have to deal, you know, eat and sleep with people that you wouldn't normally be around. See, I don't have a roommate. I'm on the mental health unit. 
because I'm supposed to be crazy, you know what I mean? But however, I come here, I get my GED, I went to college. I heard the, the rumors when I was in county jail about how all these uh, women stand and watch you get off of the bus and they pick who their woman is going to be. <laughs> What do you think the biggest misconception of a woman's prison is? I think it's basically that everyone here is bad and that everyone here was sent here to change their ways, rehabilitate themselves so that they can be a better citizen. Jane Huck has been the warden at Dwight since 1982. To stay on top of life in the prison, she walks the ground several times a day and she knows most of the inmates by name. Many times what people believe it is that it is the responsibility of corrections officials to rehabilitate a woman. And that's just not true. Um, there is no way that I can make another human being change. Four times a day, a head count is made of the inmates. They have to stay in their rooms or at their jobs until the guards, or COs as they're called, have accounted for everyone. At Dwight, the housing units are called cottages, and like cell blocks, they have numbers. C7 is a minimum security cottage. The women who live here call it senior citizens because a number of them are older, like Elizabeth Jones, the mother of eight children. She's been in prison four times for drug and theft defenses, and she knows how it changes you. It make you cold. It make you bitter. It make you rebellious. Has it done all of that to you? Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about the rules and regulations. Are there too many rules for you here? They got more rules here than they do COs. And a lot of the rules they got, I don't, I feel as though if they didn't have, it'd be a, they wouldn't have as much trouble as they do out the women. What kind of trouble? As far as them having to write tickets of women talking back and things. You know, you can hold a donkey too tight and he gonna kick you. You give him a little slack, he'll walk right. Women tend to receive more disciplinary reports while in prison from staff. Um, than the men do. And sometimes that's as high as 25 to 30 percent more disciplinary reports. And part of that is because women sometimes are expected by society to be a certain way. Ladies. Ladies. Over at C14, a maximum security cottage, you find women who don't always act like ladies. What are we going to do about it? But we weren't doing them a plan. That isn't a plan to shove somebody uh -huh, no. like that Okay, would you just listen? And cuss them out. I, I didn't curse them out. I didn't curse them out. Would you listen at me? My cigarette dropped. She tried to grab It's not okay for them to kind of be off the cuff, as sometimes it is for the men. And so if you find that a woman is a bit insolent, she will receive a ticket for that. We weren't doing them a plan. We always do that. That's not playing. Hey, in maximum security, women are locked in their rooms at 8.30. And they're not permitted to walk around the grounds. All these buttons here open the doors to the individual rooms. And this key here opens the door to the gate, each wing. And uh, buttons for the front door. And just all the doors in the entire unit. A woman's security classification depends more on her age, her previous criminal history, and her behavior than the length of her sentence and the seriousness of her crime. In a women's prison, maximum security is more for the young and rebellious than the dangerous. That's all right. You just got off the floor and you came over here to find your lover. We have a few residents that are a little tougher than others. Basically, it just depends. It depends on the day, the moods. Sometimes they are really maximum security, and sometimes they're not. Need them open your hands. Theft and forgery have brought 23-year-old Lisa Ridgway to prison twice. 
She's in maximum security, not because her crimes are serious, but because she's a young repeat offender who misbehaves in prison. I've got my share of disciplinary reports here. Are you dangerous? No. I've never committed a crime that's hurt anybody. They might have took a financial loss, but never have I physically attacked a person for no reason. Some of the prisoners here that I've spoken with say it's inconceivable to them that someone would spend time in, he in here, go out, and find themselves back in here again. When you go out there and you don't really have the support, you know, you don't have anybody that's really behind you, no money, nowhere to stay, you're going to do something to survive, you know, regardless of the consequences that come behind it. There's a special place in prison for women who do what they want without regard for the consequences. It's called segregation. Women come here for committing the most serious offenses while in prison, like stealing, fighting, or sexual misconduct. Except for a shower and one hour of recreation, they spend the whole day locked alone in their rooms. Deborah Lynch assaulted a guard. Normally, she can't stand in the hall talking to her friend. But today, her toilet is broken, and she's been let out so the plumbers can fix it. When Deborah is locked in her cell, another side of her emerges. She writes essays about herself and about prison. Prison is a place where the first person you see looks like an all-American college girl. And you're surprised. Later you're disgusted because the people on the outside still have the same prejudice about prisoners you once had. Lock up, ladies. Prison is a place where you go to bed before you're tired. It's a place where you escape by reading, by playing cards, by daydreaming, or by going mad. Prison is a place where the flame in every woman burns low. For some, it goes out, but for most, it flickers weakly sometimes flashing brightly, but never seems to burn as it once did. Prison is a place where you can go for months without feeling the touch of a human hand or even hearing a kind word. Yeah, wow. Prison is a place where you learn nobody needs you and the world goes on without you. houses the women of the honors cottage. Honors is the highest form of minimum security. These inmates have more freedom and more privileges than anyone else. All of them are serving long sentences for serious crimes. These long timers are generally older, better educated, and tend to have middle or working class values. Most of them have only committed one crime, and statistics indicate that they will never be in trouble again. A number of them are battered wives, like Cheryl Hobbs, who was 21 years old when she came to prison for murder. There were a couple weeks there when I started feeling like a raccoon. You know, like, whenever I had the black eyes, I wouldn't go anywhere. I wouldn't even go out of the trailer to get the mail. No. I didn't tell anyone in my family what I was going through because I didn't want to hear I told you so, you know. I started believing, you know, hey, this is all your fault. You should have listened to him, you know. When your husband was beating you, did you ever just think about getting up and leaving? Yes. I had attempted that twice, and him and some of the guys that he associated with came and got me. So you felt that there was nowhere to go? Nowhere to go. The trail park that we lived in, okay, you cannot call the police for any marital problems. Otherwise, you would get um, kicked out of the trail park. And how did you make him finally stop beating you? He didn't stop until... Well, actually, the last night, 
The night that I shot him, we had just really argued a lot, okay? And I was so worn out mentally and hurt and frustrated and, and mad at him and angry. And a part of me, I believe, even hated him, okay? You know? Um, he wanted me to sleep on the couch, okay? And he threw the blanket into the hallway and started cussing me out. And I, I believe that was the final straw, okay? I remember um, walking down the hallway. I remember going into our first bedroom, which at that time had nothing really in it, you know, snowblower, nothing really. And I got his gun and I went in the bedroom and I shot him. I couldn't take it no more, you know, it was like, this is all I get, you know, in return for being cooped up in this trailer. You know, you know, if I go anywhere and he calls, look out, okay? I can't turn to no one. I, you know, if I call my mom, she's gonna say, well, I told you so. I didn't want to hear that, you know? It was like I didn't want to, I didn't want to put up with all the abuse, okay? I wanted things to be right between us. I wanted to make my marriage work. I was so determined that it would work. And I just held on, you know, so I just couldn't hang no more. That was it. What would you say if you knew that there was a woman watching this who was being beaten by her husband and who was thinking about killing him? Please go to a battered wife center now. If you have children, take them with you. You know. He, I know that you love him. You know, I love my husband, too. But you need help. No, don't, don't say you're not going to go for the kids, because it could be the kids next. You never know. You've been in here seven and a half years. What's it like today compared to when you first walked through those gates? It's changed dramatically. Population has tripled. Because of that, a lot of the rules have had to change. You know, the time here is mental, OK? Appearance-wise, it looks like a college campus. Like I said, you do your time, it's mental time you're doing here. What you doing? Get ready to dance. Hey, you want to go to the of the women in the honors cottage are murderers. In fact, a higher percentage of women are in prison for murder than men. But when women kill, they kill the people who are closest to them. Their husbands, lovers, family members, sometimes their children. In general, these women are not dangerous to anyone else. Pamela Pastorino is a murderer. After eight years at Dwight, she's preparing for her first parole hearing. I don't think I have a chance. Why not? Because I don't know anyone that's ever made the board the first time that's ever gone in front of the pro board the first time with my kind of time. What kind of time do you have? 20 to 60. To make a good impression on the parole board, she's put on her best clothes and dyed her hair auburn. Before she sees anyone from the outside, she has to be frisked. Cigarettes? Any pass? Okay. Pamela's family has stood by her. While her mother takes care of her son, her father, her two brothers, and her sister-in-law have come to be with her for her parole hearing. You have been found guilty by a jury and sentenced by the court, and so we cannot go back and retry your case today. You understand that? We will assume that they were right. You had never had any trouble with the law before your arrest. No. What was your life like before you got in trouble? My life was nice. It was fine. I had a job. I worked. I lived by myself. With, well, I lived with my son. And sometimes my sister would come over and spend the weekend with me. And it was nice. Pam, there's a letter here from the office of the state's attorney of Cook County. It's, of course, protesting your parole. That's almost always the case. They almost always uh, protest a case of this sort. What happened? 
Well, an argument broke out, and we got into a fight, and my stepfather wound up getting killed. When you think about that, can you believe that? No. I can't even believe I did something like that. I can't even believe it happened. Because my mom and my stepfather had been together since I was 14 years old. It's not like they just met each other and married each other and we killed them. I mean, they had been together eight years. He had practically raised my sister. But he had a very bad drinking problem also. He was an alcoholic. How did you kill your stepfather? We beat him to death. Pamela then uh, began to beat him about the head with a metal pipe as Debbie stabbed him. After beating the victim to death, the defendant, Pamela, fled to Arizona. It did not happen, nothing like it says in the statements or the statement of facts. There's a lot more to it than, you know, was brought out at that time. Do people who are in for long periods of time like yourself do you do your time differently than those who come in here for theft or robbery for a year or two? Yes. When you have a long time, you try to make your time constructive. You try to get involved in things to um, keep your mind occupied. It makes your time go by, you know, a little bit faster. Where the short timers, they just come in and out, in and out, in and out like there's a revolving door out there. They don't care. You know, they just don't care. Some of them do care, but most of them don't. And it makes you mad because you're in here and you're trying your best to get out, knowing you wouldn't try to break the law anymore or get into trouble, and, and you don't go nowhere. Why do you think you should be paroled? Because I feel that I realize what I did was wrong, and... My son is 14 years old now, and he was only four years old when this happened, and I would like to spend the rest of his teen years with him, you know, to try to raise him. And I just feel that I'm ready for society. I'm very sorry for what happened. He has said to me, uh, do you think you'll come home when I'm 11? Well, how about when I'm 12, you know? And now he's saying, well, I'm 14 now. You know, I graduate in June. Do you think you'd be home when I graduate? And I just try to explain to him that I don't know when I'm coming home. Thank you. get paroled, but the board has agreed to hear her case again in a year. The 600 women incarcerated at Dwight are estimated to have collectively 1,500 children, or 2.5 children for every woman here. When mothers go to prison, their children are uprooted and sent to live with whomever can be found to take care of them. Prison and social service authorities say the long-term impact on the children is so destructive that it often breeds a whole new generation of offenders. While society has not paid much attention to the problem, the mothers are acutely aware of it. In fact, if anything distinguishes women from men in prison, it's their deep longing for and guilt about their kids. To me, it's a nightmare. It really is. You're taken away from your kids. Your kids are away from you. He's holding his own, and that's um, something that I can't be. I can't be protective because my children are just at the mercy of my family and people, you know. And I have to pray and just depend on God that, you know, nobody mistreats them because you never know when people are going to take advantage of your children when you're in jail. And there's nothing you can do, you know, and it hurts, you know, it hurts. How many women in this prison are mothers? At least 80%, as far as we know. Jeannie Fairman is the family advocate at Dwight. She runs a unique program to keep mothers in touch with their children. 
even though you're here, you try to maintain some kind of cons relationship with your children. You, you are part of their lives is, is, to the extent that you can be. Yeah. But, right? you know, my kids are grown now. They were little kids when I came in the penitentiary. They're grown now. How, I mean, you know, I, I wouldn't know how to really relate to them because I still have a tendency to look at them as little kids because I guess I lost all those years, you know. I heard him say, how can you tell me what to do? You in the penitentiary, my daddy in the penitentiary. How can y'all tell me what to do? What's the biggest misconception about women who are in prison who also happen to be mothers? That they're not good mothers, that they don't care. One thing about being in prison is that I feel people judge you and your motherhood because you are a prisoner, you know, and I've, I've always been a good mother. My children are my life. But how can these mothers actually mother their children if they're in prison? And obviously, they have to do it long distance, so to speak. But it's important how they could do it is maintain as much contact with those kids as they can to let the children know they aren't forgotten, to let them know that one day they are going to be back together and be reunited as a family. They could do that through mail, through visits, through regular phone calls as much as possible. Has anybody ever had a problem with, like, when your kids first came down for the first time? I said I had the handcuffs. And then she said, how come you got the bracelets on? That's what she thought I had on, some bracelets. She goes, I thought you said you were coming home. I said, I'll be home soon. I should have told them, though, my problem was telling them I was coming. So she thought she, when she came to see me that I could just get up and go with her, you know? And I did. And I know she, she was screaming, yelling, you know. This little boy was born here. But to see his mother, he has to go through the same search and identification process as everyone else who comes to visit an inmate. Get your with you. Okay, have a seat. Take your shoes off. Stand up. The kids are a victim, and sometimes, a lot of times, the forgotten victim. The children are displaced. They're placed in, with strangers. They're punished just as the mother's punished. They put them through hell when they come through here. They put them through shakedowns. I've seen kids come in and cry. They're always crying. They cry when they come in. They cry when they go out. I had to kiss them first. Hi, man. <laughs> What happens to these children whose mothers are in prison? How do they grow up? What are their futures like? For some of the kids, and I think this is a small percentage of the kids, um, they grow up okay. But the larger percentage of the kids, I think, grow up completely lost. And as a result of that, um, they too themselves become involved in criminal activity, um, which in many instances lead to places just like this. And that's very alarming to me. It's not very uncommon to see the mother here, the father in a male institution, and the child in one of our juvenile facilities. It's not uncommon anymore at all. How old are you? Two years old. Two years old. Some children, like Nathan, have lived in foster homes from infancy. His foster mother has brought him down to visit his real mother. Could you see? He hasn't seen her and she hasn't seen him. I think just one time. Once, um, only once. And now he's kind of work up here, slowly, he's playing. But he may not really know who he's playing with. You know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Nathan? You want two of them? Nathan? This is a special election report from News 4 New York, the New York primaries. Here is Chuck Scarborough. Good evening once again. We're going to switch now live to Dukakis headquarters at the Omni Park Central Hotel in Manhattan. There is Michael Dukakis who was about to speak to his supporters. He, of course, is our projected winner in the crucial New York primary with its very, very rich pot of 255 Democratic delegates up for grabs here. He uh, is winning a comfortable victory with Jesse Jackson coming in second. You can see to Michael Dukakis's right, your left, his wife Kitty, and his sister uh, is standing behind him just be beneath the uh, podium. Olympia Dukakis. Now, this is a, a big moment, obviously, for him because he hopes that by winning convincingly in New York, the Democratic Party will finally recognize his candidacy as uh, the most serious one for the uh, nomination of their party and will rally behind him. Here she is. Here she is. He's introducing his sister, Olympia Dukakis. 
His car, pardon me, his cousin Olympia, not his sister, my mistake. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you. For the first time in this campaign for the past two weeks, can you hear me? We've had a slight slip up. I have the text of a speech around here someplace. Where is it? Bruce, where's Garamello? My friends, in Iowa, we won the bronze. In New Hampshire, we won a gold. And tonight, we won the Oscar. It appears we've temporarily lost audio now from the headquarters, but uh, Michael Dukakis, as he stands there, is certainly a survivor of a long, hard-fought campaign that has started with seven candidates, and Gary Hart dropped out, Richard Gephardt dropped out, Bruce Babbitt dropped out, Paul Simon dropped out, and Al Gore apparently now is on the verge of dropping out after his defeat. He uh, will be lucky to end up in double digits this evening in New York when all the votes are counted. We will have a complete coverage for you with a special one-hour edition of News 4 New York tonight at 11 o'clock. I'm Chuck Scarborough. This has been a special election report from News 4 New York. We now rejoin the NBC News special, Women Behind Bars. I needed to call my children, you know, and talk to them. This institution will allow that, but it's just a minimum because there's so many women and so many children all over the country that you're limited in how many calls that you can make to your children. Hey, I'm going to call you, okay? Take care of your brother. As long as I got them and whatever of me that I can give them and they want it, I still got a lot of life, you know. So they, they keep, me, keep me strong to um, get through. In prison, all individual freedoms are lost. That's one of the realities of prison life. The reality of the outside world is that when a woman is released from prison, she's expected to get a job, get her children back, and lead a respectable life. A lot of women say that if they'd been able to get a job, they wouldn't be in a place like this. But people wonder, does the time a woman spends in prison make her any more prepared to lead a productive life? At Dwight, everybody has an assignment. 50% of the women are in school. The other 50% are doing a prison job. Dwight is fortunate in being able to find prison occupations for all the women because work is one of the biggest management problems in a prison. Providing work for the inmates to do that has a purpose, pays money, and leads to a job on the outside. Women have far fewer opportunities for educational and vocational rehabilitation than men. More often than not, those programs that are available prepare women for low-paying, traditionally female jobs, like cosmetology, housekeeping, and food service. There's very little career counseling in a prison, and women who will need to work all their lives are not guided towards fields that will allow them to earn enough money to support themselves and their children. Here we have a program that gets you pre-established for welfare before you leave prison. But there's no program to get you pre-established for working. It takes more than programs to rehabilitate a criminal. A woman must also motivate herself, 
and many don't. That earn that kind of money. One woman who has found the determination to try to change her life is Diane Maxwell, a heroin addict for 10 years. Why are you in here? What theft? What did you steal? Clothes. Each time? Yeah, each time. That was my hustle, stealing clothes. Before you got in here, what was your life like out there? Out there, be, being a drug addict is like, that's like your whole life. Everybody you know, where you go, what you do, it's all got to do with getting money, getting dope, and around and around and around. And each time, I, it ends me up in prison. And when I'm in prison, I, it ends me up here alone. The crowd is never here, it's just me. So I decided I would try it different. Since I knew I was gonna do some time, so I'm gonna try this differently. Check out some of these things that I didn't try before and see what happened. See, I've been arrested 65 times. And 65? 65 times I've been arrested and been to the penitentiary four times. All of this happened in 10 years. I don't have, I do not have another chance coming. It's not like that. I can't take a chance, not even on an eyebrow pencil. I can't do it. How are you prepared in here to go out there and not take drugs and not steal and get your life together? Okay, as far as working uh, academically, I'm working on my bachelor's while going to Lincoln College. I go full time. As far as therapeutically, I attend AA meetings on Sunday. Now, the reason that I attend AA meetings is because right now, as of yet, we don't have Narcotics Anonymous. So I attend the Alcoholics Anonymous simply for a support. And I'm telling you, at this point in my life, I have accomplished more positive things in the time that I've been here than I have in my whole life. This is the most, this is the most positive accomplishments I've made in my whole life, aside from giving birth to my two children. Prison life has a different effect on men and women, and it reinforces different characteristics. In men, it's violence. In women, it's dependency. Prison life, with its many rules and its systems of rewards and punishments, fosters dependency. And prisons don't encourage women to become self-reliant, because dependent women are easier to manage. It wouldn't be so bad if we weren't treated like children. You know, we're told when to sleep, when to eat, when to go to work, when to come in, when to go to rec, when you can go to walk, when you go to church. And that's bad. That's bad. Because when you get in the street, then you don't have nobody to tell you what to do. You have to think for yourself. When you're in prison, they take the responsibility. You don't have to worry about the rent, the light, the gas, or anything like that. Certain time you go to eat, the food's there, you don't have to worry about that. And so... In a way, it takes all those responsibilities away from you. And in that sense, it, instead of preparing you, it kind of makes you unprepared. I think women tend to be many times dependent before they're locked up and after they arrive here. The dependency continues. You only can grow so much in the penitentiary. And if you go to blossoming too much, they have a tendency to pull you backwards. Women need to have someone to, to lean on. Uh, they need to have someone to say, I care, you're important. And it would appear that they need that more so than male inmates. What's the biggest problem about being in a place like this for a long time? The biggest problem, aside from being away from my family and my kids, uh, not being able to have a conjugal visit. That's the biggest problem. Everything else is more or less just petty. How would conjugal visits make life different here? Because you'd feel better about yourself. Um, I think a lot of women get into homosexuality because they're lonely and they need, they need that affection. And sometimes the only way they can find it is through another person, whether it's a man or a woman. And Everyone has sexual desires.
How big of an issue or a topic of discussion is homosexuality in here? It's a big issue. Is it just talked about or? No, it's performed. There's a lot of homosexuality in here. And so what do you do if you're not into that? Not much you can do. The need for affection and someone to rely on manifests itself in another very different way. Sometimes women recreate family relationships, mothers, fathers, and children. I think you will find that in different prisons more so than others, um, but that's one thing that women's prisons are known for is grouping together, recreating the family setting. Who's your dad? Denise. <laughs> Why is Denise your father? Well, she's kind of tough. You know, hey, don't bother my daughter, you know? And then my mother, you know, she's like, she's soft, you know, she, she's sweet. You say some of the girls call you mom. Do you think of them as daughters? Yes, yeah, some of them. Tell me about that. Well, some of the girls down here are nice girls they first time around and some of them are scared some of them just need somebody that they can sit down and talk to so what's, uh, what's special about today i'm packing i'm getting ready to go home in the morning after i go home i'm going to ponderosa steakhouse I told him I was gonna miss you, little Earl. I'm gonna cry when you leave, that's my friend. I'm gonna cry too. I love you, Dad. I love you too, Earl. That's my baby. You get attached to some and some you don't. And some you hate to leave. I hate to leave her and Tina, my roommate, down here. Because you get attached. And a lot of feelings get involved, and you have to go off, and you have to leave them, and they have to be here. And you can't come see them. Why can't you come see them? It's against parole laws. You can't come visit. And I'm just going to miss her. I'm going to go. I'm going to go. Elizabeth is going home for the fourth time. This time, she says she'll never be back. I know that within me. I'm not coming back. You know, the best thing they got going down here is education. Because each girl strives on that on her own. She don't get no more out of the education system than what she put into it. Industry will help because it's giving them a training. But other than that, they don't have nothing to train you down here. It's wasted time. I don't mind. It's the devil's workshop. I love you. I love you, too. Okay, you don't cry. Be I'm good. not. I'm going to be good. Okay. I'm out of breath. Okay. I got to go. Bye-bye. Okay, bye. Okay. You want a coat? I'm on Ohio State giving me. Uh, I'll take the gray one. Yeah, I can work in these. I'll take them back. When a woman's released, she gets some new clothes and $100. Good luck to you. Thank you. Bye. Y'all be good. Okay. See, uh, when you get to the free world. Well, everybody has a different purpose, uh, meaning of what prison is. Prison, they, I feel as though they take us off the street to try to rehabilitate us. But you, how can you rehabilitate grown people when you don't have nothing to rehabilitate them with? You have to want rehabilitation from within. You know, they can't give it to you. Nobody can give it to you. You have to want it. You have to grasp it. But today I realize that I'm responsible for myself and that it's me 
who can make it better. And it's me who will have to do what's necessary. The women know they've broken the law. When they leave, they are as wary of being accepted by society as it is of them. I'm Maria Shriver. Good night from all of us at NBC News.